uh, uh, phenomenal piece of work and a, and a lot to consider. Um, like any uh, fantastic documentary, and you've made uh, over 100 films for uh, television and, and for 100 films and TV, full length t uh, films and TV shows. And uh, this is, of course, it's obviously about Eero Saarinen and his architecture, but it's so much more than that. It's obviously a family story. It's a story about love in different relationships and a love of architecture. It's a story about faith and spirituality in a lot of ways um, and, and creativity and design. Uh, there's just so much involved and, and wrapping it all together, story of family, obviously. Um, so uh, did it, was it immediately apparent to you that you were gonna make this film that was gonna be about Eric's sort of coming to terms with his father? Well, How did know, Eric get involved? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because that was the um, key element in this. When I began to think about making this film, and I knew that Eric Saarinen was the son, was a well-known um, director of photography in Hollywood. He had shot a lot of early uh, Roger Corman films. He did some of the Albert Brooks films, many, many award-winning commercials. So I had heard of him, and I knew he was one of the top people out there. So obviously, he was the first choice to shoot it. And when I called him up, the first thing he said was, no way, I don't want to have anything to do with this project. And I didn't know the backstory, you know, that you see in the film. Um, so I couldn't figure that out, and I kept bothering him, and it took about a year, um, you know, uh, on and off to try to convince him to do this. And he finally agreed to shoot it when he read the love letters back and forth between his father and Aline Saarinen, of which we only have four or five in this film, but there were about a hundred letters back and forth in the, in the year or two before they were married. And when he read those, he realized um, how important she was to him, and in a sense forgave him for leaving the family. Um, and then he called me up and said, okay, I think I've come to terms with it. Let's, let's work together on it. Well, that, that's an amazing process. I mean, there's a certain element of Bridges in Madison County about that because you would think it would be the most painful thing for him to read would be those love letters, given his relationship to his mother and his abandonment by his father and so forth. So that's, that is beautiful in itself that, that that kind of love could bridge that gap. So you had an assignment and you had an idea to do the film first and then you sought him out? Is that how it happened? Yeah, you were going to do a film about Arrow anyway? Yeah, but you know, I didn't think you could make a film. I was struggling with a story. You need a story in all of these things. I didn't think you could make a film about architecture and as amazing as these buildings are, and each one is a different story, as we say. It's not like the same Frank Lloyd Wright house one after the other. These are, every project is a different story. But I didn't think you could make a documentary of building one through ten in a linear way um, you would lose your audience by the second or third building. So I was always looking for some way to tie it together w w you know, with, with a story. So when you run out of um, storytelling in, say, the building, you get the end of that story, we would then have something to cut to, like where were we in the story between Eric and his father, or the story between Arrow and Aline. So having these sort of three parallel stories going, it really made um, the editing easier. Is Chris, Chris, Liam, are you here? No? Oh, there. where's Chris? Oh, okay, our editor is back there. So she knows about this. I mean, we really struggled for many, many months in the edit room of um, how, to, how to put it together. And I like having Chris at Q&As because if you have questions about why did we leave something out, you know, we can blame it on her now. <laughs> well, that's always, good. always a good thing. But that is, in essence, what makes the film so compelling because we are, first of all, it's not just a, a, a presentation about the architecture. It's like, okay, it's, a, it's not a seminar. It's like, there's this building, there's this building, there's this building. Now we have the humanity tied to it, not only the humanity of the architect and how he's connected to his work and design, but also the humanity. And architecture itself is a blending of form and humanity. It's, it, it is an empty shell without its connection to the human form, and that's what comes out through and through in, in his discussions of his architecture, is how is it related to function? How is it more than just shelter for human beings? And it came to me through and through, before we even got to the church designs, was I was thinking that all these buildings represent temples. Uh, they're of their own kind, and he's talking about connecting to the idea of flight and of travel and, and of what's making it, uh, uh, it more than just a barn with an ice rink in it and capturing the excitement of that. But that's the human element. These are the human elements, and they're sort of spiritual elements, too. You know, and also I think they're more than temples. When Eric and I, we first did a scout trip, just the two of us, and I had my own little, you know, lightweight digital camera observing him at each building before we went back to each place with our full crew with pi drone pilots and 
25 other people. But um, as Eric and I came upon each one of these buildings, and I had been seeing some of them for the first time, and he was seeing some of the first time, uh, it's a good way to put it. They're like temples. We also thought they were like from some other planet. We couldn't read, you come upon the arch, you don't know where that idea could have come from. Right. Um, and it's, a, it's sort of a mystery, as he called it, a, you know, a magical uh, mystery tour. Well, it is, and, and, and that goes to uh, the, the act of creativity itself, which we look at in a lot of documentaries, is, is trying to get inside the artist's head, trying to get inside the person's uh, idea of what makes them go to the places they go that are inventions, new inventions. Um, you know, just one, one other thing about, um, not making it about architecture, which I don't think people are interested in architecture per se or art per se. I mean, people really obviously want a human story behind everything. And because th 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 we're part of an American Masters tribute here, um, because this film was a for American Masters, which, ha which reaches a very large, completely general audience. I would think in our audience, this airs on December 27th. Um, I would think in our, our audience out there throughout the whole country, maybe one in 10 people may have heard of Saarinen. Or if they, if they know the name, it has to do with the furniture. So they don't know this story. So you do have to do a documentary that that appeals to people who are not interested in architecture. Well, and, and, and that goes back to the idea of the family story because, because Eric confesses that he's discovering these things for the first time. So as we discover them for the first time or see them again, but get to see them through the eyes of the creator. Because I remember going the first time I went into the TWA building. And I, it was, I think it was just right after it opened because it was 1962 or 62 probably when I was in there. And um, it was, it was mind-boggling then, but now we discover it from his son's point of view. It's not just discovering it as the, as the documentarian discovers it, and we discover it with him. We're discovering it with a family member who has a whole mix of emotions involved. So We're, we're lucky Eric could pull that off, and you know, I had some doubts about it at first, and very few people, I mean, I would hate to walk around the country and have a camera crew following me. You'd be very, most people would be sort of very, you know, not, not themselves at, in a situation like that. But I think Eric was able to pull it off because something bigger was happening. You know, he really in his mind was coming to terms with what this work really was all about. Well, one last thing about the air date. Um, that you know, a lot of us independent producers, you can make a film, you can love your film, people can respond to it really well, but it's always a challenge to get it to a large audience. Um, a lot of these documentaries have a short theatrical run and then they go to Blu-ray or DVD and they kind of disappear. And those of us who have been fortunate enough to, um, for example, the filmmakers who you know, did the Maya Angelou coming up have done three other American masters. We've done four other American masters. Th this is a format that lets independent filmmakers um, reach, you know, really reach an audience that we wouldn't really have uh, otherwise. You, can't, you, can't, you can no longer create a standalone film or documentary and expect it to go on television. Everything is now kind of part of an ongoing series. Yeah. So it's really lucky this is about the only strand, really, on, well, on and PBS it's, and that it's lets this show be seen. The genius of it is, uh, in this case, it's, it's borne out by this case because it makes the story more than just about uh, the history of this person. It gets into the human side, and there's nothing more human than family and family issues like this. And, and I was going to say that um, for Eric, uh, as being a filmmaker, it might make it a little easier for him to go around with a film crew and so forth. But the, the generational aspect of it's about the work, it's about the work for Elio, for Eero. And in this essence, uh, in, this, in this matter, um, by Eric being able to do work on this project and be a person in the Saarinen family who's, it's all about the work, and now he's doing work on his father's work. So it's, it's a continuation of the same thing and making a thing of beauty. Now, I was going to ask you the script for him to read and, and to, to go into as he, as he told his story. Did he write all of that? Um, you know, it's really not scripted. Um, everything that you hear from him was um, said to me verbatim when the camera was running or if we had to go back on it for various reasons, some of the things that are used more from voiceover are just put together from his actual language. Um, it was another way for us to get around the Writers Guild, which is what's <laughs> holding back. The Writers Guild deals at PBS hold back so many great projects right. because unless you're not writing something, unless you really can tell them that it's coming out of the documentary material, um, you have residuals. I mean, the writers get much more than us directors or producers or anybody. Every time it's repeated,
repeated, they get money. And you can't really budget um, these days for a documentary if you're going to have to pay a, a writer's guild fee on it. Oh, so that's not. why I'm asking, uh, answering this very diplomatically. No, 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 I he, we didn't write anything. Well, and that's, and I think, but that also goes to the authenticity of it because one senses it, it's obviously obvious, it's clear that it's authentic emotion that he's going through, but all the more so because it's it's sui generis. It's not it's not from a script. It's not from something prepared either by him or by anybody else. So that's a beautiful thing. I wanted to mention also um, the uh, the the choice of music. Okay. Fantastic. Moby, yeah. yeah. So how did that come about? Um, you know, I had known, those of us who go back to the 70s, 80s, and 90s probably know Moby. Do, do people in this audience know the music of Moby? Um, yeah, Young, younger kids don't. When I've talked to some millennials, they don't have a clue who he was. But he's a very popular electronic composer in the 80s and 90s. And I had read about him, um, and some of this has stuck in my mind, but years ago I read that he loved architecture. He felt his music had a lot to do with architecture, and he was very fond of Eros Aronin. So when we began to think about how to do the music for this film, um, I began to listen to, Moby has hundreds of albums out there, and it took a long time. Actually, my daughter, who's here, helped me. She was in the music business. Uh, Tanya helped. Um, we listened to Moby's music for, for a long time but you and just came up with these. These were pre-existing cues that he had already composed for other things and that we got his agreement to be able to use in the film. And, and you, are, you knew beforehand that he'd already said he actually liked Saarinen? Yeah, I read that somewhere in a piece about Moby. Because it, it was it was a perfect blend because of, of uh, Moby's own futuristic kind of sort of spiritual curve to his music that just so completely married to this. So that's yeah. another kind of genius. Um, some of it was composed. Sometimes we would end a Moby song and start another one and there wouldn't be the right transition. Or Moby actually didn't have endings. Everything just faded out into infinity all the time. And we needed some endings. So we did have a really wonderful composer, Christopher Reef, who's out in Los Angeles, who kind of did some of the transitional pieces in there. But, ba but basically 90% of it is Moby. But that's interesting that you say that uh, his, he doesn't have endings, that they kind of trail off into infinity because that's a lot of what the forms that Saren is creating are doing the same thing. So that's another way that they blend perfectly. You know, I think music is a huge part of these uh, types of projects. Um, I, I'm not somebody who's done films with a lot of interviews in them. Uh, in this film, there are interviews. We needed some transitionals. We needed somebody to say Detroit was the center of the design world. But maybe out of this 68 minutes, maybe two or three minutes are interviews on camera, which I think slows everything down when you do documentaries. So you, we tried to rely, and this was an ideal time to do it, I think. It doesn't always work, but we really tried to rely on the impact of visuals and music. I wish there was actually less talking in this film. If we would have had another 20 minutes in running time, I'd let some of these beautiful drone shots that Eric created just play out for it, because we're cutting out of them when something else amazing is about to happen, which you don't see in the film. Well, I, I agree with that, but I do think that there the was real value. You got real bang for your buck in the interviews you had because a lot of that, for the Sulzberger, obviously, the, um, the Catherine McGuigan, uh, you, you get the context there that creates a framework for that humanity to work inside yeah. of. I, I think you need interviews for that exact same thing to put your story in context of the times, but you can't create your story by going out to start to interview people about your subject and have them tell you about it and then use that as the building blocks to create your documentary because right. then it's all interview based and it's all verbal, which is okay in a radio show or if you're writing a, a book, but the, these are films. This is supposed to be cinema. So you have to find ways to tell the story that are, that are purely visual. And then you lose track of the humanity. So, um, well, I have to say that uh, among my favorite parts, and there were many, and I could go on for days, but we do have to wrap it up and I want to give a question or two from the audience but uh, the, uh, the, the marrying of the design for Detroit and the cars, the old cars, and, and looking at that, just it was, it was fantastic. That view of the 50s, that view of the future that we had and, and how it put together. And the other fascinating thing was all those projects that were not finished when he died and that Aileen finished. Or saw, yeah. saw through. I mean, I, mean I, I don't want the film to be misleading in that she actually finished the right. design work. I agree. Um, she wasn't, um, she was incredibly supportive of, of uh, Eros Saarinen, but she wasn't an architect. She wasn't even a creative person. She was a brilliant journalist. So, but what happens, I, I was trained as an architect. I got my degree from Cornell, I got my master's from Yale. I never went into it because I never thought you could make a living 
as an architect. <laughs> and not, not that you, that I know we have architects here, and I, I admire architects tremendously because I know how hard it is to do. Um, but not that documentary filmmaking is a great way to make a living either. Not journalism either. But, but the one thing I do know about architecture is once designs are finished, buildings in many cases turn out differently unless the architect is on site, is on top of that every day so materials don't get changed, colors don't get changed, sometimes spaces get changed. And Aline really did that. I mean, she made sure that these buildings were designed the way he wanted them to be. And I think if you took her out of the Aerosaranen equation, I don't think we'd have exactly the same buildings out there today. Exactly. So I think we have time for maybe one, two questions from the audience. Anybody want to uh, have a question? Because I'll just keep talking to him if you don't. You know, that's fine. Wait, up here. Uh, Lily, yeah, um, the, the the sculptress. Yeah, I mean, I wish we could have done more with her. And Eric kept pushing. You know, Eric had some very strong ideas about this film, as you can imagine. And one of the ones that I really had to listen to and took very seriously was the importance of his mother's influence on Eric, uh, on Eros Aaron. And um, because, as you can see, that work is phenomenal. And she did hundreds of pieces, which are all gone now. Nobody seems to know where the sculpture of Lily Saarinen is. It'd be a wonderful project to try to find those pieces somewhere. But um, she, you know, we, 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 I think we said in the film, she, she was depressed. Um, she never saw, saw him. Um, the, you know, the, the divorce was very difficult. It took, took a year or so. Um, Eric told me she, you know, she was ill. She, she wasn't capable of, um, of you know, bringing up her family. So um, she, she died um, you know, several years after uh, uh, Arrow did. And the, son, uh, and the son that, the other question that comes up is what happened to the son Eames that Arrow and Aline had who we didn't have in the film because he, he had some developmental problems as he grew up. And the, fam the Saarinen family, Eric and his sister, asked me not, not to um, you know, bring him into this because he wasn't quite together on what the story was all about. I do think it was beautifully tied together. Her sculptural forms, you could see them echoed in a lot of his work. So I mean, that, that was brought to bear. And his sculptural background himself, but she did open him up to certain things. And as he pointed out in the film, that she opened, she came at the right time, as did Eileen. Yeah, and um, you know, it's a story where two, two very, very important women um, are behind that the results, really, in, in a way. I also wanted to do as much as I could with Aline because when we first started to look at all these black and white photos we had to work with, hundreds of them from the Yale Archive, from the Smithsonian, from Cranbrook, um, it's all guys. They're all these guys uh, with white shirts, thin black ties, smoking cigarettes. And it's in every picture, all you saw were men. You know? yeah. So I'm thinking there's got to be there's got to be a woman in this story somewhere. And the more we looked into the role that Aline played and by reading these letters, and as a matter of fact, you know, all these letters are online. At I guess you go to Smithsonian.gov. And you can look up the Aline Saren in letters because her whole archives are there. And it makes an amazing story, just these letters. And Kathleen McQuiggan, who's in the film, who is now the editor of Architectural Record, is writing a book called The Architecture of Love, which is just going to be about that relationship. Well, and his love of the architecture, his love of his wife, his love of everything. It's a beautiful story. And uh, oh, wait a minute, we have one other question right here. Yeah, I think I think we all have better chances these days. But in the 50s, it was a tumor in in the in the part of the brain that was inoperable, um, and they said there's nothing we could do. But you know, he just didn't want to live as a uh, as some a creative person, not any longer having the creative part of his brain functioning. That probably was um, a better way to die for him. I would assume. Well, what his sister, I think, helped with the film. Yeah. Uh, oh, Eric's sister. Yeah, that, um, Su Susan Saarinen is a very important part of the Saarinen legacy. Um, for all the 50 years that Eric had nothing to do with, with his father, many of those years, Susan, who you only see briefly in some of the home movies, was in charge of Saarinen Designs, the licensing of the furniture, keeping the Saarinen name uh, and the legacy going. So when we began, when the three of us began to talk about this project, Susan agreed with me and Eric that since he had not done anything for 50 years and she had been hard at work, this was going to be his thing. That we weren't going to go to her at all 
and let Eric tell this story as a way to, um, you know, and again, come to terms with all those missing, missing years. And she was very gracious and sort of agreed with that, that this was going to be Eric's story and not, not hers in any way. Thank you very much. Thank you.